Hey there nation and welcome to the show where we help you to play miniatures wargaming on a budget. It is I, Commander Cheapskate, and we are back with another episode of Commander Cheapskate Game Reviews. And this is the series that is dedicated to showing you various products related to the miniature wargaming hobby. And on today's episode, we will be taking a look at the latest Nicaragua supplement released by Games Workshop. This is, of course, House of Faith. This is the Cador Gang specific rulebook for the Nicaragua campaign system. Now, in case you guys are unaware, what's been happening is that Games Workshop has been releasing supplemental books for each of the different gangs and the noble houses of Nicaragua. Uh, basically, they start off with the Goliaths with the House of uh, Chains, then they release the uh, House of Blades for the Escher, they release the House of Iron for the Orlocks, and this is their latest one, House of Faith, and this one is for the Cotor Gang. So we'll be taking a look at this product, specifically we'll look at the table of contents of what's inside of it and talk about some of the pros, the cons about this product and whether we think this is a good buy for you to use in your games in Necromunda. So that being said, let's get this review on a roll. So first of all, as you can see here, we have our table of contents and of course where it talks about the background of House Cawdor as well as its lore, we're going to pretty much skip that because whether you like lore or not, that's really not the purpose of the review. The main thing is talking about the different rule sets that we have for this uh, game. So specifically, we'll be looking uh, directly at the table of contents. So we're gonna go through the table of contents bit by bit, talk about the various aspects of it and what our viewpoints are about each of them. So first of all, let's go ahead and start off with our House God or Gang List, which is probably the number one reason why you would purchase this product, which is of course for the composition for all the gangs. Now, as you can see on this table of contents, of course, we do have different names associated for all the different, uh, different levels of characters that you can have in your gang. And uh, that, of course, has been seen through all the different books. They've had different names for each of the different uh, fighters. So leaders have now specific titles. Same thing with gangers, same thing with juvies, uh, prospects, and the like. Now for this one, of course, this one's actually kind of interesting because this book is actually kind of like two different gang compositions in one book is pretty much how it works. Uh, ideally, what, how it works is that you have two gangs that are offered in this game. You Actually, technically, three gangs. You have your traditional House Cotter gang, which you guys have been playing for uh, Nicaragua up to this point. You guys have seen those. Those guys, of course, are represented by the Cotter Workkeeper, which is the leader of the gang. You have the Cotter Firebrand, which is like the champion. You have the Cotter Brethren, which are the gangers. And, of course, you have the Bone Pickers, which are the uh, Juvies. They don't have prospects at all in this gang uh, for either side. And the reason why is because of the two different gangs that you have for, available for you. So those are House Cotter guys. Now, at the same time, they also give you rules to create a Redemptionist gang. Now, if you're in case you're unfamiliar with what Redemptionists are, Redemptionists were a gang that were available in the very first edition of Necromunda that was released back in the mid-90s. Uh, originally, Necromunda had a, a Games Workshop made an expansion to Necromunda called Outlanders, and in that game set, you could play various outlawed gangs uh, that were associated with uh, Necromunda, and Redemptionists were an outlaw gang. Um, if you want to know what the difference are between Cawdor or Redemptionists, think of it this way. Think of Redemptionists as being religious fanatics to the point of being actually religious terrorists. Is basically what the difference is, alright? While your average Joe, while everyone within House Cawdor is a zealot and an extremist in the sense that they follow this new religion, the religion, the cult of redemption, they all follow that. The difference though is that Cawdor gangs, while they do follow the tenets of the cult of redemption though, they still operate granted loosely but they still operate within the overall laws of lord helmwater's laws within the uh, the within the spire of necromunda redemptionist gangs however they are members of house Cotter, but they're religious extremists to the point where they're actually like terrorists almost and basically that makes them outlaw they cause too much destruction and they break the law all the time and that's where the differences come in now, of course, uh, for your Redemptionists, you have your Redemption Redemptor Priests, which is like your leader for your gang. You have Redemptionist Deacons, which are basically like your champions. You then have Redemptionist Brethren, which are your gangers, and you have a Zealots, which are your, uh, which are your juvies uh, in that sense. Now, like I said before, this is actually kind of like three gangs in one book because you could play a purely House Cotter gang, or you could play a purely Redemptionist gang if you want to, or you can actually have a combination of both. You could actually have Cotter and Redemptionists intermix together one single gang. Now, the difference between this, though, is a special rule. We're going to talk about that real quick. We're going to talk about real quick with our word keepers and our Redemptionist priests. So let me go and click on that real quick for our table of contents. Okay, so the word keeper, for example, the major difference with him is that he has a special rule called Pious, all right? Now, what ends up happening for this special rule is that in case you take a cold check, you roll a double one on your cold check. You can re-roll that, of course, and then, you know, take another cold check. But what happens is that this keyword Pious is very important because so long as you have more members of your gang who use this pious special rule, they are a law-abiding house caught or gang. Now on the other side, if we go to our Redemptor Priest, for example, they also have a special rule called Fanatical. And their rule is pretty much the same as the pious rule in terms of your cool checks. 
That's exactly the same. The difference, though, is that you have this fanatical keyword. Now, if your gang should have more fanatical members of your gang rather than pious, then it becomes an outlaw gang, and that's pretty much how it works, okay? So that's the reason why we have the two different uh, styles of gangs on this one, because you have your um, pious members of your gang and your, and, your, and your fanatical members of your gangs, and that kind of determines your overall uh, legal outlaw or law-abiding status for your gang. So, of course, there are plus and negatives to being an outlaw gang and being a law-abiding gang, and that just kind of put up to you for individual choices. Now, as for stats, the stats between these guys are relatively the same. There's not much difference and not enough of a dramatic difference, in my opinion, between these different gang members to kind of differentiate them. The major difference, though, are their equipment lists, the things that they can take. For example, Redemptionists have access to what's called an Exterminator. An Exterminator is an attachment that they can add to their guns, and also, also a lot of the melee weapons that they have in this edition. And think of them as one-shot flamers is what they are, okay? So if you're really big on using flamer weapons, and you want to play that specifically for your, uh, for your Redemptionists, you can equip an Exterminator to their weapons, and they can use that as kind of like a one-shot flamer. So that's just an example that they have. They also have a thing called uh, uh, Incombustible Halberts that the Redemptions can wear, which means they basically get a bonus to save from Blaze special rules for weapon attacks. And they also have what's called known as a Pyromantic, uh, co uh, pyromantic uh, Glaive, I believe is what it's called. Basically, it's the little basket that they wear at the top of their heads that is full of fire that makes all their attacks, both close combat and range attacks, blazing attacks, which are also really cool as well. So that's the major difference between them. It's not so much uh, the rules and the stats are the major differences. The major difference is the equipment that they primarily take. So based on how you want to play your gang and the different things that they have, of course, you can pick and choose. And the nice thing about this is that you don't have to play a strictly Cawdor or a strictly, a strictly Redemptionist gang. You can intermix them both. And that actually gives you a lot of flexibility for Cotter gangers. So if you're playing the Cotter gang, uh, it adds you a lot more diversity in your troops. So it's actually kind of nice that they actually did that. Now, another thing they have, of course, for their exotic beasts, we have the Sheen Birds. Those are, of course, from the previous edition with the uh, 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 the gang booklet that you got earlier. We also have what's known as the Cherub Servitors, which those are brand new, which are basically the flying mechanical babies that kind of uh, follow along with your characters. These things are kind of cool because what they do, for the most part, they really don't have any real good offensive abilities, but they're really great for defensive because, for example, if you have a member who has a Cherub Servitor being shot at, the Cherub Servitor can take the hit instead of you. Your fighter so that's actually kind of thing you want to look at so for example if your leader's getting picked off all the time you might want to get him a couple of cherub servitors to kind of protect them that way so that's really cool as well now when it comes to hangarounds and brutes we actually have a few specific ones uh specifically that are just unique to the Connor gang of course they have their usual uh ability to get most characters that they want that they usually get uh the stig shambler of course makes the return of course it's a little bit more expensive in points for Stig Shambler, and that's because you're not paying for as many things. For example, um, in the previous gang book, if you want to buy twin linked uh, stub guns, you have to pay for that. That automatically comes with the Cotter Stig Shambler now. So it's a little bit of a good take on that part. So that part's really cool. But for these two specific ones, the Hive Preacher and the Flagellator, these are actually two very specific ones for Cotter gangs specifically. Now, for the Hive Preacher, what this one actually evolves with is that this character gives you bonuses to your brand new uh, game mechanic which is called the uh, Articles of Faith game mechanic. We'll talk about that a little bit more in detail here in a little bit. So that's where that pretty much comes into effect. So that's a really a big um, use for that to kind of help you out with your uh, Article of Faith rules. Now the Flagellator is actually kind of cool too because what he does is basically he's a guy who's got like whips for arms and every single time you have a fighter that goes to recovery, you can actually roll using the Flagellator and basically they just kind of whip this guy back into healing. Like, you know, the beatings will continue until morale improves type of character. So that way that fighter can take place the next scenario if you want to so that's kind of an option which is actually kind of neat it just kind of very much thematically and narratively fits within the Cotter gang and what they're all about and of course you have your hive scum bounty hunters and house agents and those relatively remain the same as in all the editions of the books up to this point now for your alliances of course we start seeing some more alliances house Cotter guys now have strong alliances with the uh with the uh, uh rogue factoria which is their criminal alliance so they actually have that now so that's their criminal alliance that they have so, of course, if you bought the Book of Perils, you know exactly what those guys are capable of. And the Saints, oh, sorry, the Book of Judgment, rather. And then you have, of course, the Corpse Harvesting Party, which is their guild alliance that they have as well. And that's one of the Book of Perils on that, which also kind of makes sense because, you know, Cotter guys are usually like the poorest of the poor within Nicomoda. They basically make up the largest population of the planet, and uh, they do most of the menial jobs, especially with waste disposal. So because of that, that's how players they work. So that's kind of cool with them. Now, of course, you have a new uh, new noble house, of course, and each of the noble houses have been introduced slowly in these edition books. So one of them, of course, is House Koiron. I believe is how you pronounce it, Koiron or Koiron. Um, 
It's a fictional word, so I'm assuming I can say however I want. So House Kowarn, the Ministorum uh, delegation, that's a new little group that they actually have. It's pretty much a three-man party that's added to your gang. Um, they're very much like the uh, Redemptionists. These basically guys who are like religious uh, fanatics within this noble house. And they're the reason why they're so closely allied with Kaldor, because according to the Fluff, they both kind of follow the same kind of rules. Uh, not much really uh, difference between these guys and the House Korion guys. Um, they're pretty much kind of equipped the same way as their counter guys. The nice thing about these guys though, they kind of give you more bodies that you can use in the battlefield as well. So for example, if we were to click on these guys real quick, we have this uh, Emperor Protects rule that basically says that uh, gives you rule number one, you know, double ones for the most part. You know, their stats are relatively the same as well. Not much difference between these guys for the most part. So that's the reason why. I mean, it's kind of a cool little uh, addition that you can add if you need more bodies in your gang. But uh, as for like any extreme type of uh, help for the most part, not so much. Um, the, the Actually, in my opinion, the negatives of working with House Korion actually outweighs the positives. So I'm not really sure, you know, if it's a really good alliance or not. But that's just perfect. That's just me personally from my view, viewpoint. Now, of course, what we have now, of course, the additional rules, like just like with all the other books, you have your house favors, your house subplots to kind of give you guys experience repetition as well as experience points in your games. We do now have a new set of called piety skills. They're out now, which are actually kind of cool. Uh, the piety skills are actually kind of cool. A lot more of your redemptionists miniatures can actually gain access to the piety skill. Uh, they mainly have this as a primary, while as most normal counter guys have this as a secondary skill. But things that you have, of course, for example, there's a cool little game mechanic that helps you have better uh, chances with your bomb delivery rats, for example. That's one of the skills that they have. One of the coolest one is Scavenger's Eye, which basically means that every single time you actually roll for credits as a reward, you actually add plus one to your roll. So, for example, if a scenario gives you D3 uh, times 10 credits, you actually get D3 plus one times credits. So if you're looking for ways to generate more income, for a gang, and that's actually one of those things that actually can be really cool as well. Now, let's go ahead and talk about the newest game mechanic for these guys. This one's called Articles of Faith. Now, Articles of Faith is actually kind of cool because what ends up happening is that you have basically four different paths that you can take uh, for your Articles of Faith. And what ends up happening is that you have to, during the end phase, you roll a d6 for each of your fighters, and on a roll of five to six, you generate what's called a faith die. And then, of course, you could actually have your guys do a basic a double action called Beseech the God Emperor, which means they don't do nothing. But you roll 3d6 for that fighter during the end phase instead of the usual one, and you generate these faith dice. Now these faith dice can then be used in order to do, give you different bonuses throughout the game. Alright, like I said before, there are basically four different paths that you can take. Um, and what you do is whenever you want to use one of these Articles of Faith special rule, you take a number of your faith dice and you roll it, and you add the values together. If those values are higher than the value needed to get that ability, you get that off, all right? Now, this part is actually kind of important because when you create your Cawdor or Redemptionist gang or hybrid gang, what you have to do is you have to choose which article of faith or which path in the article of faith you want to take. And like I said, there are four different ones and they give you both positives and negative ones that you can use. So let's actually, let's kind of dive this one in a little bit more into this one, for example. So for example, you have what's called the Path of the Faithful, you have the Path of the Fanatic, you have the Path of the Doomed, as well as the Path of the Redeemer. And basically, whatever your game style is, which you think you're probably going to use, uh, that's the one you should pick. For example, the Path of the Faith one, for example, is the most common one most people use. Uh, what ends up happening is this one, you roll an additional D6 for each friendly house, card, or leader, or champion that is on the battlefield, for example. So you can generate additional Faith dice for those guys. And for example, if we were to use actually one of these rules, for example, let's say like, for example, oh, let's take a look at this one. And contempt shall my uh, shall be my armor. So you roll your threshold, which is the value you must get with your with your D6. And it says while this article fits in effect, this fighter, any friendly house caught or fighter than six inches of them may be tar may not be targeted by and are immune to the effects of psychic powers. However, should the threshold test be failed and this article of faith not invoked, this fighter reduces their willpower by one for the remainder of the battle. Okay, so for example, these actually give you some pretty good bonuses throughout the game. It actually gives you a lot of oomph and a little bit more of an edge over other gangs because they have all kinds of different things. For example, in uh, the Path of the Dune, for example, uh, you get additional faith dice for each person that's out of action in your game. So that's a really cool one as well. So for example, if you think you're going to lose a lot of battles, you could actually use that Path of Doom and actually kind of give you bonuses to your troops. In fact, in the Path of Doom, there's a cool one where basically your character becomes like a suicide bomber. Uh, they move up a simple action, and then they blow up using a large template as a strength 3. I think it's a th strength 3, minus 1 AP, 1 damage attack. So you can actually turn your guys into like a, a suicide bomber if you want to for example. So it just kind of depends on what you want to use and what kind of gaming style you want to use for your gang and that's pretty much how you determine what kind of article of faith and path you should take uh, for that one as well. 
And uh, I did say there were four paths. Technically speaking, there's actually five paths because the fifth path is actually one that you can make. Uh, the rules state that if you're a Cardor player, you can actually make your own path. And based on your own path, what you can do is take different art different rules from each of the Articles of Faith. There's four of them. You can take up to four from any mixture of them at all, and you can make your very own customized path. The only problem with the fifth one, though, is that, as you saw before, we talked about the uh, first one, the very first one where you roll a five or a six, you get additional d6 for each champion and, and leader you have in the, in the game that's still alive. Uh, those additional bonuses you don't get. So you only get the actual game mechanics, you don't get any bonuses. So that's like, once again, going to your own kind of give and take on that one, whether how you want to you know choose what path you want to use or whatever. At the same time, of course, we also have our new reference tables as cool as well. We have some new weapons in this one. For example, the Eviscerator makes a return in this game of Necromunda. In case of those of you who are not familiar, imagine Eviscerator being a giant two-handed chainsaw weapon. It's the one that you would see, oh, what's it called? Uh, Warhammer Quest Blackstone Fortress. It's a character who actually has a Eviscerator that they actually use as a redemptionist character. And that's one of the party members you can use. It's a giant two-handed chain sword but the cool thing about that weapon though it also has a flamer attached to the bottom of it as well so not only can you hack guys apart you could also set them on fire in fact the reason why i'm talking about the eviscerator so much is because in previous editions of necromunda especially in the very first set what you want to do is use your zealots which are basically your really cheap you know um you know really cheap juvie type of characters and what people like to used to do back then is equip those guys with uh, with eviscerators so that way they can run up and chainsaw people apart and Sipping them on fire, so you know, all kinds of cool things like that. So, that part's kind of neat there, too. And at the same time, the house counter gang tactics make a return with a D66 table, so that's really nice. So, in case you want to buy the cards, you now have the rules for your gang tactics, so that part's really nice. And then, finally, we're going to talk about real quick are the Dramatis Personae. Now, personally, I don't care about Dramatis Personae too much. Um, I mean, they're a neat game mechanic, but they usually cost a lot more credits than they're worth, in my opinion. But there are two characters that do make a return in this edition. Clovis the Redeemer as well as Deacon Malakiv. Both those guys make a return. Now for those of you guys who are familiar with older editions of Necromunda, uh, Clovis the Redeemer is actually a special character that was the Redemptionist special character. The guy had an eviscerator and basically traveled around in this vehicle. I think he was called the Redeemer. I forgot the name of the vehicle was called. But basically it was like a stretch limo with a shot flamer that had flamethrowers attached to it. And he had this assistant named Deacon Malakiv that kind of ran around with him and gave him bonuses, defensive bonuses with him as well. Well, these two characters do make a return in this edition as well. In fact, for those of you guys who read the Cal Jericho novels growing up, uh, this character is mentioned quite a bit in those novels. So he is back as well. Now, the vehicle that he drives, of course, is not available in this edition of Nekamunda. I'm hoping eventually Games Workshop will release a rules pack where you can actually use vehicles, like fighting out in the Ash Waste, like we're doing on Anarchy Rogue. Yes, I just put an Anarchy Rogue plot in there. Shameless self-promotion, I know, but I can do that if I want to. So hopefully they'll do that one day, and that will be actually really cool as well. So there you guys have it. This is pretty much my quick review of uh, Nicaragua's House of Faith. My overall impression is that this is an excellent buy. So, for example, if you're playing a Cowder Gang and you really want to, or if you want to play Redemptionist, this is a really good buy for you to uh, purchase so that we can get those rules for those gangs. At the same time, those Articles of Faith game mechanic look really, really cool. Narratively, it fits very, very well with Necromunda. Uh, Necromunda has always been more of a role-playing and uh, fluff type of game rather than a competitive game. And so that just kind of adds into that as well. So if you're one of those kind of guys who'd like to make overpowered lists, quote unquote overpower list or you like to pay competitively Nicaragua does not really the game for you because uh, it's more about having fun rather than you know competitiveness so that's just my little two bits on there as well so I suggest that you get it it's a really good product I really especially like bringing back the redemptionists again that part is really really nice bringing those guys back I was hoping they would do that and uh, I'm glad to see that happening what I really want them to do now for games workshop is to bring back pit slaves because those guys are fun to play uh, Ratskin Scouts, Ratskins, those guys are a lot of fun to play. The Ratskins are like the native population of Necromunda. They're kind of like a tribal society, kind of like a, a, as a, like kind of compared to Native American tribal groups that live in Necromunda. They wear the furs of giant rats. That's why they're called Ratskins. I hope they bring those guys back as well because they had a really cool game mechanic. And I really, really hope that they bring back Scabies. Scabies were like the mutated like dregs of Necromunda. They're kind of like people from the Hills Have Eyes. I mean, they're really, really cool as well. If they can bring those guys back in different games, that would be really, really awesome as well. So you guys have it. Uh, as always, please feel free to like, comment, and or subscribe. Your guys' input is valuable to us as always. Also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, as well as blogger.com for all the latest, greatest hobby news related to our channel. That's good for this one, you guys. We'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace out and stay classy.